Welcome back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Everybody here, everybody, we are thrilled you're here. We have a very interesting conversation today with Peter Heller, CEO and founder of Heller Fundraising Group. He's going to be talking to us about fundraising and nonprofit self-esteem. Peter, do you think that we have problems with our self-esteem across the sector? Well, let me just start, Julia, by saying I have it myself. So how could it not be in the sector? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, there's no hope for us if that's the case. Well, I have never thought about this, but I, in prepping for your visit today, I've been trying to think about um, as a community fundraiser, I've never been a paid fundraiser, but I've raised a lot of money in my community and I've been fearless about doing it. Um, there's been a difference when I had better self-esteem about the organization that I was mm -hmm. speaking about. And I realize that now after, you know, starting this deck with you. And so I can't wait to talk about this. Another thing I want to make sure that I don't miss out on is, is thanking our sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. We have really been excited, um, Peter, to launch a new panel of co-hosts. They come from all over um, the nation. Um, they bring a lot of diversity, different areas that they work in. And so um, hopefully all of our viewers and our listeners have been able to start to meet them. We've just rolled them out in the last month and a half, and it's really an exciting journey that we're on with these amazing, amazing thought leaders in our sector. Peter Heller, you're a thought leader as well, my friend. Talk to us about Heller Fundraising Group. And I got to start off with a question. Talk to me about this Infinity logo with the dollar bills floating off of it. It's very yeah, that, was, that was one of those weird things that just hit me uh, when I started this company 20 years ago. Um, I, and this really relates to the self-esteem thing. I mean, we're in a, a, a world you were just talking with me about weather and climate change. And we're in a world where there are a lot of really challenging things going on. And um, we believe it's really important to to try to uh, address those from an abundance mindset. And uh, that means, you know, how can we create abundance in the nonprofits and the communities that those nonprofits serve so that so that the world uh, continues to become, you know, a, a safer and better place uh, bit by bit. And so the logo is really about money shooting out of a of an infinity sign. It's infinite money. And uh, uh, if you want to um, kind of understand the origins of that, uh, if you can go to our website uh, and read a bit, there's a bit uh, written there on that. It's a good yeah. place to visit anyway. Well, your website's really robust and I, I really uh, liked it. I liked learning about you and, and kind of getting a feel for what you all do and, and how you approach this. But I want to get right into this because I've never heard anybody actually articulate this or even point out the concept of nonprofit self-esteem. What is that? What does it look like to you? Yeah. So let me start by by backing up just one minute and, and say one or two things about the Heller Fundraising Group, because I think it gives some context for this. Um, so, you know, we're a small uh, but quite powerful uh, consulting company that helps uh, nonprofits of all sorts with their fundraising strategies, and particularly campaigns and feasibility studies and, and major gift programs. And over the years, we've kind of spent a lot of time looking at what's going on underneath why a particular organization can or can't raise the money it needs and uh you know there's a there's a lot of things there's there's staffing there's training there's you know whether your story is right and we'll get to that a bit later um you know a whole lot of things and like i said kind of buried underneath there somewhere is self esteem of your organi organization where do you think you are in the spectrum of things. Do you matter? Um, and well, I'm going to keep saying more about this. I, that's, I'll just leave it there at, with that. 
you know, Peter, I, I'm thinking of um, COVID and when we started to realize that this pandemic was going to alter the trajectory of our, our families, our businesses, our, our communities, I felt myself pull back and start to really um, favor or disfavor certain organizations. So I'll be very candid. I was like, you know, money to cultural institutions needs to fall because we need to start moving, you know, money towards our our social services and human services. And I feel like that's somewhat of a self-esteem issue, how we judge things to be more appropriate or more valuable. And I'm wondering if that's part of this discussion, like how we see ourselves and how we see the viability or the importance of whatever the, the nonprofit mission is. Yeah, so, so you've said so many important things right in that, that little uh, statement there. So, because I actually did want to address COVID as well. And I, I think your uh, initial reaction was very typical. And at the same time, uh, not only was my company working with cultural and, and non-direct responder organizations at that time, but you know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of them throughout the world that are doing important work. And uh, COVID and the pandemic is a great uh, sort of case study of what self-esteem is all about. And it really helped me um, uh, focus the conversation. And, and this is what I mean. Um, every or And, and I, I felt this before the pandemic, but I feel this even more strongly. Uh, and I'm going to kind of cut to the chase. If you as a person working at a nonprofit, board member of a nonprofit, even funder of a nonprofit, but let's stick now with board members and 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 staff. If you can't wake up in the morning and say, this nonprofit is crucial to the future of humanity. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a little way. I mean that in a big way. Like mm -hmm. it might just be an, a social service organization that works on a corner of a neighborhood. You have to figure out why you matter and connect that to then doing your work, whether you're a fundraiser or whether you're, you know, leading programs or or entering data, I don't I don't care what you're doing. But if if you're if you can't figure out why your work matters, you're probably a not going to be happy in your job. You're not going to be doing a good job. And if you're leading the organization, you're either the wrong person for that or the organization should shut down. Okay, I'm going to be that clear. So COVID really focused that for me. I was very much a fan, just as I was in the Great Recession and when 9-11 happened, um, those are moments, there's moments to pause some activities, but if you can't use those moments to figure out the importance of why you exist as an organization, you've got an organizational problem. And that's what the self-esteem is really about. I think that's, I, I love this conversation. And, um, you know, I think it's, Sometimes we sense this, but we don't give voice to it. Or we don't have that nomenclature like self-esteem. So let's talk about this case study and the, the self-esteem syndrome. What does that look like? And, and can you elaborate like how we need to be thinking about this? Absolutely. So I'm going to give two examples, uh, one from years and years ago, and, and then the other I was during the pandemic and 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 it's it's Ill illustrative if that's the right word. Um so years ago uh our company which uh happens to be based in New York City though we work with organizations uh throughout the country and and overseas as well. Um we worked with a theater arts organization in Manhattan in New York City that was crucial to the off-Broadway and the Broadway and off-off Broadway theater community. They did behind the scenes stuff like renting closet space, helping with budgets, all kinds of things that that ecosystem could not live without. Right. Yet, when I would sit in a board meeting as my as my client, they they the board would go around, oh, you know, we're not the theater, we're not Lincoln Center, we're not the, like, how are we ever gonna raise money? How are we gonna do this or that? And I mean, first of all, I, I I said two things to them. 
because we were in the process of build of a campaign, a multi-million dollar campaign to build, actually build some theaters, which is a whole nother story. But I said two things. One is, first of all, look at your database and your annual report. You actually do raise money and you people around the table are giving money. So it's not true that nobody's going to support you because you actually already are. And the other thing is cut it out, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> so. you need, like, don't, that mindset is going to damage you know, your own conversations, it was, it was kind of like a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, I mean, we could talk about that particular organization for, for a while, but more importantly, that's an example of low self-esteem for an organization. It's same thing happens with um, like a, a organization that works with children and they're like, we're not save the children. How are we ever, you know, because they're huge, right? Doesn't matter. You're important. If you can't figure out why you're important, you know, get some help to figure that out. And, and because you are important. Mm -hmm. The second so me, piece, I'm sorry, go ahead. Now let me back up. So when you said that to, I would imagine these sophisticated people within their sector and their, you know, leaders within the sector, when you said that, were they like, wow, I never thought of it that way. Or could they buy in or how did that shake them up? If you will. Yeah. So, you know, I, people who know me know that I'm not shy about saying the things that, that are on my mind. And I, I try to do it in, in a, a nice way, but we, you know, we think of uh, consultants as, as having to be the dominant monkey sometimes, mm -hmm. but you know, you want to <laughs> say it in, in like, you want to wrap the client in a nice warm blanket, even though you're the dominant monkey. And, um, you know, different people are going to respond to that in different ways. You, you, most of the time you can't just make a statement and then boom behavior changes you you have to work with people along a period of time and, and you know and that's what it that's what it took to get there with the, with those folks um i i we also did a you know we came we had a few uh, aha moments on how to explain their organization that that helped with that as well um so uh, may i get to the other example yes absolutely cuz yeah. i think that's going to help us understand this even more yeah so uh a well about a year into the pandemic so like fall of 2021 um i got back in touch with somebody uh who who i had hired at when i was an employee at a at a nonprofit and they were one of my staff members and they had moved on to a senior position at one of the uh, boston area hospitals mm -hmm. and um she uh, actually to this day is still the um director of development for their psychiatry department OK, and now you can make an argument like, you know, mental health was a very big issue during the pandemic still is. Um, but that's you know, they weren't dealing with first time, you know, front responders or whatever there. So I'm, I'm talking to her and I'm like, hey, how's it going, Deborah? What's going on? And. She's like, oh, you know, I'm raising six figure gifts all the time and she was doing it through Zoom. Right now, that wasn't in the pandemic. We were advising people. So it's not the first time I heard it. But the, the aha moment for me there was the people at this hospital wake up in the morning. They're like, we deserve money because we're doing important stuff. We're going to just go and ask for it. Yeah. And that allowed us to further inspire a lot of our clients. Just like, mm -hmm. do it. <laughs> yeah. If you will. And and I think that, um, you know, it's not, it doesn't always turn on like a switch like that. Um, you you have to find what's motivating and what's aspirational. And and like I was talking about our logo, what's, you know, what's going to help build abundance. Um, you know, because let's face it, a lot of nonprofit work is very hard work. It's not like, it's not fun and games all the time. No, it's not. But I think it kind of speaks to your whole premise here that if you don't start out with positive self-esteem you got a whole mountain to climb right versus i love the the woman in boston who's like yeah baby let me go i've got it i'm cranking <laughs> and yeah. to her it almost sounds like she didn't i mean she might have had some tough days but like you said, she got up every day and said, I deserve this. Our group's doing the work of the angels. And by God, we're going to ask. 
So how do we create that positive self-esteem? I've got to believe that a lot of us don't even know that we're not in it, that we that we have a negative uh, mindset. Well, you know, I I mean, I think like all of us suffer at least, you know, a a, a minute now and then, if not a lot of time with (laughs) with uh, lower self-esteem. And I think I just uh, before I say a little more of that about that, I, I just want to point out that you can be any size organization or nonprofit and and have this issue depending on the mindset of the staff and how that translates into your messaging how you know what it's like uh, to be at the office every day or to be on a zoom call if you're doing remote work and you know and i've seen this at at tiny nonprofits and i've seen this at at huge universities with billion dollar endowments who who are like Oh, you know, we don't have as many billions as this other university. So we're not, you know, how can we do that? Literally, <laughs> literally. And it's like, get over yourselves already. So um, I, the, the biggest tip that I would like to share about um, building positive self-esteem in terms of organizationally uh, comes down to the story of your organization. Mm. And Here's the little tricky thing is that the story of your organization, if told really well, is really the story of a powerful, positive future for your community. Mm. Okay. So I'm going to say that again. Wow. Right. The story of your organization is the story of a powerful, positive future for your community. Mm -hmm. Now, when we work with nonprofits and particularly we're working on, on large uh, fundraising campaigns, even though they know what they're doing really well, it take usually takes an external player like us to help them figure out what that story is. Cause people are so focused on, I just got to get my job done. I get my job done. All that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, the big mistake that a lot of folks make is to tell the story of the future of their nonprofit. That's very different than the positive future of your community. Okay, that's like a mind blow moment for me because I absolutely love that. I mean, that that makes um, the concept of investment and collaboration um, moving forward a lot more easy to understand. And I think it also creates a longer term relationship discussion. And so why do you think we don't do this? Like, why is this such a hard concept for us to understand? Well, I, I don't know. I'm not like a gene. I, you know, we're all self-centered and self, yeah. you know, we, you know, so we're like, um, you know, if I have to build a new building for my school, I'm going to talk about what that building is going to do for the school. And sometimes I forget the students. I mean, I've seen case for support documents. There's one I use when I do trainings as don't do this. <laughs> and it, it literally like the document is like black and white cover and it's got a photo of the school. And then you turn the pages. You don't see, there's no pictures of kids. There's just pictures of building. It's, it's like, hello, did you forget the kids? Where, where, <laughs> we, can we have a couple kids? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think you said it uh, a wise thing and that is it really helps to get that outside voice when you're, you're tackling these things because you're, you made that comment. We're so in it. We're, we're trying to do our jobs. We've got, you know, task mentality and it's really hard to be a strategic thinker when you're trying to get through all the tasks that you just feel, um, you know, so behind on. And, and I, so I, I can see what you're, you know, kind of how you're thinking about this. I want to also before we let you go, because we don't have that much time left, but I want to spend a little bit more of this discussion talking about mindset and leading to individual self-esteem. How do we corral that and even within our teams, bring it up, right? And get them thinking this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I, I mean, obviously like, uh, what's the expression, you know, charity starts at home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's the same thing with like, self-esteem starts with with each of us and it's one of those things that first of all you have to be aware of it yeah Uh, and um 
and you know, I've spent a lifetime doing therapy. So like, I, you know, I'm, I'm like still working on it. And I I think it's something that whether, whether, you know, you're working in therapy or, you know, books and, and, or talking with your friends or what, you know, it's something to be conscious of about, oh, you know, the reason I responded in that way was because I wasn't feeling too good about myself or, you know, and then that really translates uh, very strongly into how you show up uh, you know, how you show up at your job. Um, and again, it can be virtually show up or in person, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it's an ongoing process, but it's like being aware of it is, is one really important thing. And, um, I think that there's a variety of practices that we can infuse into our workplaces that, that help on an individual level, as well as a, a organizational level. So a few things, um, for instance, that we do at, at the Heller fundraising group, um, our, we have a, a, you know, we have a small team, but we meet like every Monday by zoom and occasionally we, we meet in person and, um, we start every meeting with a, everybody goes around and they celebrate. We use that word celebrate something that they did successfully in the prior week. Mm-hmm. And then later in the week, we get together. Uh, so that's on Mondays and on Thursdays, we get together just for a brief uh, check in. And we're like, what you what went really well this week? Tell you know one thing that you were working on that was successful and one thing that you're working on that you're looking forward to, you know, the, and, and and it can also be a personal thing. It doesn't have to be work or it could be could be two things. And so that's a really small thing. But the reason for that uh, is that it's a it's just one practice that starts to reset the brain around positive stuff because we're all spending so much time on the negative stuff. And, you know, I personally, like I get up in the morning and I'm like, Oh my God, how is everything going to work today? And like, you know, so it takes a while to, to, you know, some people get up in the morning and they're like, today is amazing. And I'm like, you know, okay, I, I want to be there. I'm not always there. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I, uh, it's so fascinating you would say that because I just spent uh, four days on a leadership exchange on the Navajo Nation. And the Navajo Nation is the largest tribal land and tribal nation in our country. And one of the things that they do is every single home, and it's whether it's a mud hogan or it's a trailer, their front door always faces east because they believe every morning is a reset. And when you when you see the sun rise, you are saying goodbye to yesterday, to the past, but it's a new dawn. And I was really, it, it, so it's so interesting that you would just share this with me uh, because that really resonated with me because especially in the nonprofit sector, we are so shackled by, you know, our programming and the tough things that we deal with. And then we have to fund it and we have to manage it. And it is just so arduous. Um, so this mindset piece, man, I I just don't think we're talking about this enough, right? And maybe until it's like too late, right? And I'm just so curious how we can start bringing this to the forefront. Um, because well, I'm, you know, I'm, no, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, the same thing is true with a lot of things that you want to change in cultures. You have to put time aside, whether it's in, you know, every week in our staff meeting, we're going to actually like self-esteem is not going to change by magic. It's we're actually like, let's have a conversation about it. Just like um, the culture of philanthropy doesn't change in organizations just because you want it to. You have to have, con- what does philanthropy actually mean? What, you know, why aren't we talking about it? What's, what's going on? Um, and I just want to, um, there was a something that came to mind um, years ago. I I participated in a panel in Manhattan, not not as a panelist, but I I you know I was there in the watching the panel. And one of the people on the panel was uh, the head of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is you know one of the greatest art museums in the world. And, the and this was the panel was about post nine eleven, um, you know funding and and work and every you know nonprofit environment and what he said he you know and this it was not days after it was several years after 9 11 
And he said, you know, right after 9-11, people came to our museum to understand what was important and still mattered about humanity. And, you know, I don't think the Met has a lot of problems with self-esteem, but that's a, it's a great example of connecting how a cultural arts institution matters you know, in a time where everybody, you know, maybe was thinking about and funding other things. Right. A time of social duress. Yeah. You know, to realign values and what is the sense of beauty and how does it play into, you know, our better selves. I mean, that's really profound. That's really profound. That that's my hope for the uh the cultural institutions across our country who have suffered so tremendously during the pandemic because their funding got, you know, lowered in terms of, you know, the totem pole, so to speak. And so, yeah, I I appreciate that comment. And that's really um, a strong thing to even speak to a community that had suffered so much loss in some ways. And this is maybe, you know, how we'll finish up. It's very bold. (laughs) It's very bold to have positive self-esteem and to wave that flag, right? Because not yeah, everybody well, you know, is going to. I'll tell it. you like a, a little behind the scenes thing is like we. um So, you know, I, I mentioned that celebrating thing we do. And mm-hmm. and the first time I did it with with my team was towards the beginning of the pandemic, where uh, my wife is actually the brilliant one in the family. And she'd been studying some stuff and she came up with this. Uh, or somebody had taught it to her that the idea of actually bragging um about something that you're doing and not in like you know like i'm so great i'm like i mean you can do that too but that that wasn't the point it's more just like acknowledging something that you did really well and the first time i introduced this to my team nobody wanted to brag they they were very uncomfortable with it wow and um so it was a big lesson for me about like oh okay huh what is you know what's that what's going on for people what's that what's that about you know so i i eventually changed it to celebrating which Sure. Made it more palatable. And, and change the team. And, so let me ask you this. Was it gender specific? Did uh, the females have more uh, problems celebrating or bragging than the males? Correct. Yeah. 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 And that's a whole like, you know, it's it's that's, it's it, that's a whole nother cultural and yeah. gender thing that's um yeah. that's uh, often true. Yeah. Yeah. Oft- I hear my grandmother in the back of my head. Don't be so braggadocious. <laughs> right, right. And there's, you know, there there's moments that it's that it's appropriate, and and but you know, just like self esteem, it takes to get getting those muscles, uh, yeah. warmed up and in place. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have really, really loved this conversation. Uh, Peter Heller, CEO and founder of Heller Fundraising Group. You can learn more about Peter and his team at Heller fundraisinggroup.com and you can learn more about their super cool logo that for those of you maybe listening and what not watching um, is an infinity graphic with these magical dollar bills I don't want to say dollar bills I want to say thousand dollar bills oh yeah <laughs> floating yeah. around um, but really an interesting conversation um, today that and you also said something that's a little heartbreaking, but I think true. This is not a one and done. We need to, to assume this as a practice and a mindset um, about building our self-esteem and how we value ourselves and our organizations. Um, I will always remember your story about that the hospital fundraiser in Boston, yeah. you know, just th- saying, this is it, this is what I'm going to do, and and really navigating that i think it's um really great um you know we just have a viewer that just wrote in that wrote excellent message peter so good deal oh, well, I agree. thank you yeah I glad, agree. glad we could share something interesting and useful yeah it's been a lot of fun again check out peter heller heller fundraising group.com and you can learn more about their journey and their approach to their practice as they serve the nonprofit sector across the nation Again, we're here every day because we have these amazing presenting sponsors. And it's really interesting. You know, they don't exert any um, editorial control. So we can talk about whoever we want. We can talk about their competitors. I mean, uh, it, it's really a holistic approach that's allowed us now to do this for now. We're in our fifth year and we've done um, almost uh, 1,100 uh, episodes. And so 
our gratitude really needs to be um, celebrated, to use Peter's word, uh, with our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that are really um, joined in to help our sector achieve the things that we want to achieve and, and to, to better ourselves. Peter, this has been great. I really, really love your approach and I can't wait to even be thinking about it more as we journey forward. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It's great to talk with you, Julia. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we end every episode um, of the Nonprofit Show, we end with this mantra. And today it means something completely different to me. And the message is this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here for another episode of the Nonprofit Show, everyone. 